Hello everyone and welcome back to the Color Spotlight series. Today I am a bit relieved to be talking about one pigment instead of several like we have over the last couple of weeks. And that one pigment that we are talking about today is one that I started my entire watercolor journey with many years ago with my first Daniel Smith palette. In fact, it was such a prominent color for me in those early paintings that I have that two of my most iconic paintings, the red panda and the sea turtle, were painted with it. Yes, today we are going to be looking at my favorite orange, quinacridone burnt orange. Quinacridone burnt orange is a transparent earth orange pigment made from PO48. It is a moderately valued pigment that is both light fast and staining. In its initial wet applications, it is a very saturated and vibrant pigment. However, it does have a rather large drying shift, losing up to 30% of its saturation, according to handprint.com. It is very close in color to the orange leaning PR101 burnt siennas and the transparent orange or red iron oxides. It's great for use in sunsets or desert scenes, but you might recall me stating on the channel that I don't really appreciate these orange PR101 variants of burnt siennas or at least I don't appreciate them being called burnt siennas. One of the reasons for that is that I expect my burnt siennas to make wonderful grays when they're mixed with their blue complements. And like these PR101s, PO48 does not particularly neutralize well with just about any color that I've tried in order to make a gray. It does have some absolute gorgeous mixes though, and today we are going to be taking a look at them in just a few moments. PO48 is primarily used in the automotive industry. In watercolor, it's available as a single pigment from a couple different brands, but it's also now widely used by many watercolor companies for creating the quinacridone gold hues. In 2004, Bruce from handprint.com noted that he was concerned that there might not be enough demand of manufacturers to continue making this pigment, similarly to what happened with quinacridone gold. However, as of 2012, which as far as I can tell was the last time that Bruce updated that particular entry for PO48, he reported that there hadn't been a change in supply at that time. However, for what it's worth, and I, I'm not spreading rumors here, I don't know, I wasn't able to find any answers whatsoever, but I could not find this pigment on either Kramer or Grera pigments online, so I decided to go ahead and order an extra tube just in case. This time around, we get to keep things short and sweet with our brand comparisons because I only have four brands to show you. I've arranged them from the most orange to the most earthy, so starting on the left is Coors Quinacridone Gold Deep. While it has the same name as a dual pigment from Daniel Smith's line, Coors is a single pigment PO48. Although it's still reasonably similar in color to the other brands that I have here, it is notably oranger than the other three. Next up is Da Vinci's, and this one is just fine. It's moderately placed between the others that are here, but it does seem to lack a little bit of the character, especially when compared to Daniel Smith's. However, I can say that about a lot of other colors and brands when stacked up against Daniel Smith's earth tones, so I don't know how much that's saying. Next up is Daniel Smith's, and of course, this is my favorite of the bunch. It was also my first of the bunch. It has a beautiful rich color and just enough glow and character to really make it shine out against the other ones. It's not too orange and it's not too brown, making it a perfect addition to the other earth tones that I might have in my palette. Finally, we have M. Graham's Quinacridone Rust. It is noticeably deeper and darker than the other brands, but it does come with a little bit of an asterisk. This paint has a strange texture to it, and I first saw this on the very first original swatch card that I made with this paint, although I did repaint it for this particular video just to make sure I was giving it a fair shot. The texture came back, and it is a similar texture that you might have seen in some other pigments from M. Graham, like Anthroquinone Blue. We've seen that here on the channel quite a bit, and it has kind of this interesting texture to it. And in that particular case with the blue, I don't mind it, but I specifically use this color, PO48, as my non-granulating earth tone. So for me, I don't really have a place for M. Grams in my particular palette, but that might change, especially if you're using this as one of your only earth tones on your palette. I do want to go ahead and 
point out an observation that I noticed while creating the voiceover for this video, and that is that there's a really odd pattern in that this pigment only seems to be available for American brands. I asked that as a question because I wasn't able to check every single brand, but I did check all of the big names like Schmincke, Snellier, Windsor Newton, White Knights, and I couldn't find any of them. Um, the ones that I were able to find were The Core, Daniel Smith, M. Graham, and Da Vinci, which I do have samples of here. So I found that a bit odd. Um, I will have links in the description for this video for where you can find these ones and those links will help out this channel, but do let me know in the comments below if you know of another brand that carries this pigment. Moving on to our color mixing segment, as always, if you would like to see a complete tutorial on how I mix these types of varying swatches, I'll link a tutorial in the upper right hand corner for you, but today we're specifically going to be looking at PO48 mixed with a variety of lovely pigments. First up is the obligatory Nickel Azo Yellow. And why is it obligatory, you may ask? Well, because PY150 is the other half of the formula in the most common replacement for quinacridone gold. In this row, you're gonna find a range of yellows and golds that can certainly fill in for quinacridone gold in most situations. I love the idea of having PO48 and PY50 both on a palette together so that you can make this quinacridone gold hue if you need to, but it's also very versatile in their individual pigments when you can mix them with other colors on your palette as well. Next up is Red Violet, a violet leaning version of PV19 from Rembrandt, but any PV19 will do here. Mixed with this cool red, we get some really neat earthy and really lively reds. Watered down in this particular mixture, you can also get some nice rosy Caucasian skin tones as well. In the next row, we have quinacridone burnt orange mixed with a perylene violet, and I love this mixture. It makes these really deep, rich, gorgeous browns and warm, dark skin tone type colors. I'll end up using this combination in the demonstration, so we'll see more of it in just a little bit, but like some other mixes that we've come across in this series, I'm really glad I reminded myself of this one. Here in the next row, we will have our closest to a neutral in the lineup, and I did try every type of blue that I had at my disposal. Either anthraquinone blue or ultramarine I found will get you closest, but as I mentioned before, there isn't really a great combination, in my opinion, to get grays with this type of orange hue. In this particular pairing with anthraquinone blue, we do come up with some gorgeous browns, deep sappy forest greens, and dark moody blues. Next up is probably my favorite combination with this color, and it has been one of my favorites way back when I did my sea turtle painting. PO48 and Thalo Turquoise go hand in hand together, whether they're side by side or in mixes. Once again, we have some beautiful brown combinations and I'm guessing that you'll start to see a theme here that quinacridone burnt orange is amazing at making brown tones, but we'll also find some olive greens and deep but vibrant greens as well as moody teals. This one is so versatile and one that I think is worth taking a look at in just about any palette. Finally, we have Perylene Green, which creates a range of colors that I don't really use very often, but I know a lot of you guys love them. And that would be olive greens. There's quite a range here from like a really, really young green olive to a deep foresty olive green, and they can all suit a variety of needs. At the bottom of this page, we of course have our regular pigment demonstrations, including a wet and wet application, a glaze, a lifting test, and a softening off type of display. I found this pigment to be very eager in water, spreading out quite a lot. It's very decent at glazing, moderately easy to lift on cellulose paper, although that would be harder on a cotton paper, and it's easy to control when you place it wet on dry and then soften off those edges. Okay friends, so this demonstration painting is the reason why this video took me so long to get to you. I knew right away that I wanted to paint a little foxy corn for this demonstration of quinacridone burnt orange, however it turns out that I'm not so great with the foxes. <laughs> I was really excited not only to try out the fox, but to do a little baby fox here with a tiny itty bitty little horn, but as it would turn out, the anatomy was just a little bit off. My color selections took me a while to find out while I was painting because I wasn't a good girl and I didn't do my color compositions before I started, and I completely, completely overworked the entire chest area. 
when I shared the image on Instagram stories and asked people what they thought, if I should repaint it or not, a third of the votes that came in were in favor of doing so. And despite me already knowing that this wasn't my best work, it still is a little bit uh, of a sting to hear that 70 people agree with you and that you should repaint the painting. So it took me a couple of days to rebound and try and tackle it again. For my second attempt, I decided to go ahead and try a wiser looking adult, which I had in my mind as an alternative um, before I even started painting anything that um, I thought, oh, this wise fox would be really fun to paint. I'm not entirely sure that it was a great idea to move on from the baby because he was so very cute, but the second painting, technically speaking, did come out quite a bit better. Due to the fact that the scale of the faces and the facial features are different between babies and adults, the eyes in the adult didn't end up as impactful as they did in the first one, and the colors didn't end up as deep, but at least they didn't get entirely overworked. You can really see the true nature of the orange come out in the second painting though, which I did really want to showcase obviously in this video. The main color here used was the quinacridone burnt orange, and it was used pretty much straight from the pan in a lot of this painting. This color has such a natural tone to it that it really doesn't have to be mixed with something else to be usable, unlike something like phthalo green, which almost always has to be mixed with something else. I used that perylene violet to be able to mix the really dark, uh, almost blackish purples from the ears the horn and the nose, and I finished off the very darkest details with a neutral tint from my palette to help make the rest of the painting really pop with the contrast. Mixes of perylene violet and quinacridone burnt orange were also used in a watered down form to create the shadows on the chest and different values around the entire painting. A touch of quinacridone gold was used for the eyes, although I should have probably used the nickel azo yellow to show that we can still come to this hue mixed with the quinacridone burnt orange as well. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I still don't completely love the way that this turned out, but I do think it shows off that orange pretty well, and the learning process along the way was completely invaluable. I ended up recording the entire second painting while narrating it for my patrons so that I could kind of talk through the process of having to bounce back after kind of failing on a painting. And if that process is something that interests you, I'll go ahead and put links up in the right hand corner and down in the description below so you can find that. I'll also show you both paintings side by side at the end of the video so that you can kind of compare and contrast the two. Before I go today, I do want to go ahead and put a little mention in here that there is something very exciting coming up. It seems a little bit random in this particular video, but I keep trying to find a good segue for it and my schedule has just been too nuts to be able to do that. So before any more time passes, I wanted to make sure that you all know that World Watercolor Month is coming up once again in July. Charlie O. Shields over at Doodle Wash is the incredible founder of this event, which challenges artists to create 31 watercolor paintings in 31 days, all while spreading awareness for art education and getting supplies to kids who need them over at the Dreaming Zebra Foundation. I participated in this last year by creating content uh, most of the days in July here on the channel, so if you're interested in checking out that playlist, I'll go ahead and put that in the upper right hand corner if you'd like to go ahead and see any of those. This year, I won't be posting videos here on YouTube, but I will be participating over on Instagram, and I'm also going to be a World Watercolor Artist Ambassador, which is super exciting, and I'll fill you all in on that in just a little bit. If you'd like to learn more, head on over to worldwatercolormonth.com, and I'll have a link in the description for you so you can easily find that, and let me know in the comments below if you are interested in participating this year. For now, I want to thank all of you guys for watching this video. Please consider giving this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed the content. Subscribe and hit that bell icon if you'd like to join us again for the next color spotlight, which will be on burnt and raw umbers, which I know a lot of you guys have been asking for. As always, an extra special thanks to my patrons for making this video possible, and I will see you in the next video. Happy painting!